Our talk of today, um, our president, Mr. Ad van Velde, is a proud uh, dairy farmer from the Netherlands. He will uh, introduce Global Dairy Farms in case you haven't heard of uh, our organization that much. Then we have the plenary session uh, by Pascal van Keulen and Arjan Meijerink, and we dive into the live discussion and then we have a short closure. Then Ad van Velde, the floor is yours. Please turn on your camera and your microphone. It's on now. You can hear me, Yvonne? Yes, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from my side, too, uh, a warm welcome to uh, every participant of this Global Dairy Farmers webinar about the most critical phase in the life of a dairy cow being a calf. It's fantastic that we have so many participants, quite a lot of new ones as well. Uh, it turns out that practical topics about management issues on dairy farms are always very interesting and popular. My name is Ad van Velde, dairy farmer in the Netherlands and president of Global Dairy Farmers since 2017. In recent weeks, I've spoken to many dairy farmers around the world, farmers from India, from Chile, from the US, and a number of other countries. What surprised, surprises me is that the same topics, the same issues are actually nowadays everywhere. Big issues, big challenges, but also small topics about management on our farms. In many countries, you see an enormous upscaling. For example, in the US, 20%. 22% of the dairy farmers have stopped their business in the last three years. But the milk production in the US has increased. Worldwide, the demand of dairy products is rising, mainly caused by the population growth. I'm curious what will be happening now when COVID-19 goes to its end. Of course, entre entrepreneurship on farm level is always very important. It's now and it was in the past. But today's entrepreneurship requires other qualities. Everything around sustainability, around climate change. And you have to move with all kinds of developments in countries, in regions, in societies. It's, all, it's asking different capacities, additional qualities, ensure that you will continue to be a dairy farmer and will also be successful. That's why GDF is so important. Working together, exchanging knowledge is becoming more and more important. That's also belong to modern entrepreneurship. As I said, transitions are taking place in many countries, often in terms of scale. That's why cooperation is becoming more and more important, also within global dairy farmers. As GDF members, together with our partners, we are all ready for these challenges. GDF is an independent network with an enormous passion for the, for the sector. I'm very positive about GDF, how it is going now. Webinars are very well attended. We are being approached by new business partners. It are really nice developments. Many farmers are interested in GDF and we are really waiting for a new Congress to make the next GDF step and we'll meet you all. About this webinar. We are proud to have Denkefeet as a new business partners. Pascal van Keulen and Arja Meijering will do both the presentations. As GDF, we are satisfied with all our, all our business partners. They are all the same and we are very proud to have them. But with Denkefeet, with Holm and & Lauer and Merck, we have three leading companies around the calf period. 
and they have so much uh, amount of knowledge that we as GDF should benefit even more from this company, this combination of companies. Use, I should say, use their knowledge on our farms. Uh, Arian and Pascal, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ad. Thank you very much, Ivana, for this introduction. Um, my name is Ariel Meyerik, as uh, Ad has mentioned. Um, as Dekovic, we are very, very happy uh, to be a part of uh, GDF in our first uh, year of the partnership. Uh, with GDF, we are very uh, enthusiastic uh, to be joining this group. Um, I like to start off right away. Time is short. Um, the crucial phase in the life of a dairy cow being a calf. That's quite a statement. Um, we're not saying, oh, it's, it's rather important uh, raising calves. No, the crucial phase in the life of a dairy calf. Why? Why is this so important? We put some reasons on the sheet here. What we see in practice the proper feeding management and application of milk or milk replaces can make a difference of 150 grams a day. We are not talking about an expensive calf milk replacer or a cheap one. We're talking about management and application, 150 grams a day. That's 10 kilograms at the end of your rearing period. A calf that is raised without having diarrhea, diarrhea will give milk, generate money on your farm three weeks earlier than a calf with a difficult startup. Three weeks, that can be the difference between a first calving age of 25 or 26 months, 23 or 24 months. In practice, we see huge differences between the cost of rearing heifers. They mount up to 500 euros or, or, or $600. Metabolic programming, it is not a term out of a science fiction book. Metabolic programming, it works, it's here, and it's here to stay. And a lot of our future developments in calf rearing will be based on this metabolic programming. AMR, we have all heard of it. At 2050, more people will die of antimicrobial resistance than of cancer. Imagine that. So it means, I'd ask me to, to lay out some, some, some trends for the future, that we have to focus the coming years on raising our animals, whether they are cows or piglets or whatever, raising our animals, do our animal keeping without the use of antibiotics. Before I give the word to Pascal, I like to make a very short introduction on Dekovit, on my company, our company, uh, what we do, who we are. If you look at this sheet, it has a lot of information. I like you to remind two of them. In the left bottom, you see 500,000 tons of young animal feed. That is what we do. We are specialized in the first part of the animal's life, a very short part. But we know everything about it and it's a very very important part so that's what we do that's what we are good at if you look at the other blue tile you see 500,000 calves we do not only produce this enormous amount of feed we are all also responsible guiding 500,000 calves of our own we are a farmer through this crucial part of life so we know as no other how important it is to have a good concept to have stability, the same high quality every day of the year, 365 days of the year. Based in the Netherlands does not mean that we are only producing for Dutch farmers. And this sheet, you see that Dengevit is active in more than 60 countries, and I'm pretty sure that we are in your country or very close to your country. So we know um, 
the methods of covering from all over the world, the systems, the problems. Uh, some of the problems are the same and some are different. We have a huge experience in that, in the broad range of problems. A good concept starts with perfect raw materials. Um, we live by the principle that garbage in is garbage out. 500,000 tons of feed means that 20,000 trucks of raw material enter our premises every year, 20,000 trucks. In our labs, we take samples of each and every one of these trucks. Uh, on the pictures, you see another Pascal. Um, he's our lab professional. These people, they taste, they smell, they look at the samples. And first, after the chemical analysis is ready, the truck driver is allowed to unload on the premises so that these raw materials can be processed into our feeds. If these people are not satisfied, we send it back. And it happens three, four times a month. A truck leaves our premises as full as it has entered. This is very important to us. Without the proper raw material, you can never make a perfect end product. Being very good today means that you have to be better tomorrow. This is a truth that, is, uh, that counts in your line of business on the farm. It's the same for us. That's why we put a huge amount of time and energy and money in innovation. Um, this innovation is based I on two pillars. We have the lab. Um, Ayan, excuse me? Yes. Yes. Um, I just want to ask, sorry for the interruption. I just want to make sure if everyone can hear us because we received a message that someone cannot hear the webinar. So I would just like to ask everyone to raise their hand if they can hear us. Perfect, okay. Okay, so Kerry, I'm sorry. Um, no problem, no problem. Okay, go ahead. Uh, um, so our innovation is based on three pillars. Like I said, we have our labs on the different locations. Uh, this is where we do the research in our raw materials, but we also, if you have um, a calf milk replacer, you can, it can be that it says whey on the label. We have 35 different types of whey. It can be the best of the best, it can be the worst of the worst. In our labs, we do a fingerprinting of our raw materials to make sure that we have the right digestibility and the right traits of these raw materials in place. Our innovation center, I will tell a little bit more about that later. They are practical farms. We do not bring practice our, our products into the market if we have not assured ourselves that our own animals are happy with it. We test it first on our own animals, and when they are happy, we bring them into the market. There's some key figures uh, on the right side of the sheet. Uh, what it does not say on these figures is the tremendous amount of, of passion and enthusiasm of all the people involved, involved um, in this business um, to, to be better tomorrow than we are today. And, and personally for me, that's one of the main reasons that I work at that company. Uh, we want to be better tomorrow than we are today because we know that you have to be better than you are today. Um, as a final sheet from my side, this is one of our innovation centers. It houses uh, about 3000 calves and it also facilitates a training center for our staff for the specialists who are on the way uh, in different countries with our partners and also for customers. So normally every week we get visitors from all over the world. We come and we show them our farms, our animals, our concepts and we train them. So hopefully in the near future when the world is turning back to normal, we will be able to welcome you there as well. This ends my part of the presentation. I want to give the word uh, to, uh, to Pascal. Um, and, and let him share a bit of his uh, enthusiasm for, uh, for our business. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Once again, a very warm welcome from our side. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Perhaps for the passionate people are among, uh, among us, uh, even a good night. Uh, like uh, Aya said, I would like to uh, share a little bit uh, of the, uh, the background of the knowledge that we have here at, uh, here at Denkerkit. And I'd like to do so in this in this order. So I want to make it a, a webinar that has nothing to do like a, like a sales pitch of some sort. I actually want you to learn something. I actually want you to to go to your farm tomorrow and and apply some of the things, some of the knowledge that we like to share with you tonight. So first and foremost, I'd like to discuss a little bit about the anatomy of the digestive tract of that cat. 
the esophageal groove. Perhaps you've heard of this before, uh, maybe a long time ago at school, I'd like to um, repeat it once again. What is this esophageal groove? Scours, scours cause number one. It's a, a big issue in mortality in, in those young animals. But what is the number one, from our point of view, uh, world number one problem causing scours? Then the fourth topic that I'd like to discuss is the feeding systems. There are plenty. There is a whole variation of feeding system and methods all around the world. Five, a couple of take home messages. I mean, I don't want you to remember the whole webinar, but a couple of take home messages is not too much to ask. And then the last one, the Q&A and the live discussion. Um, we are here to answer all your questions regarding uh, calf rearing in general. So we start with this uh, beautiful young animal. It's a Holstein Frisian black and white heifer calf, called her Stella for now. And uh, today we uh, were able to, uh, to look Stella from the inside. What I'd like to discuss, what I'd like to focus on as, as of today is the digestive tract, starting with the esophagus that brings the feed, the liquid from the mouth to the four stomach complex. The four stomach complex starts with the reticulum and with the rumen often combined which is called the reticular rumen. Then we have the omasum. And then at last of the four stomach complex, we have the abomasum. This is also called the true stomach. Why is it called the true stomach? Because this is the one that resembles most of what our stomach looks like, low in pH, for example. And last but not least, everything will go through the small intestine, large intestine, and back on the outside. So there's two pieces, two parts of this four stomach complex that I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit further. So as you can see, right at birth, the abomasum is about 70% of the total stomach complex. So it's a huge part of those four stomachs. The rumen, however, even though a calf is a young rumen, the rumen only occupies 20%. Later in life, you see that the rumen increases in size quite rapidly. And I'll show you some of the examples that I have taken, that I have brought with me later on in the live discussion. So the rumen increases in size quite extremely, whereas the abomasum doesn't. So relatively, over time, the abomasum becomes less and less big, so to say. But at birth, the abomasum is really the focal point of attention in calf digestion. So here I, um, I have a picture of this uh, organ complex that I also brought with me. Um, when the live discussion starts in the Q&A, you are probably able to see it a little bit bigger. But in this case also, you see the rumen, you see the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum. But then there is one special creation that is not an organ per se, that is not part of the, uh, one of the stomachs, but it is a esophageal groove. So basically it's a muscle vault that can open and close. And this esophageal groove is one of the most incredible and most important parts of the calf digestive system. And this is what we will be focusing on as of today. And also in this case, you see the small intestine, everything will go that way. When I turn around this, organ complex, I want to focus a little bit more on this esophageal groove. And as you can see, there is like, it's a two volt muscular groove. And I would like to um, explain it when I, when people ask me, how do I explain it in person? I get a piece of paper, a piece of paper like, like this. And now as you can see, it is open. But whenever a calf, for example, suckles, on a teeth or a nipple, the esophageal groove closes and basically it forms a tube. And this esophageal groove is of utmost importance that all the liquids, all the milk, for example, that goes through the esophagus, it enters the esophageal groove and it bypasses the rumen. The rumen is right underneath here. And because of this tube, it can bypass the rumen and go directly to the abomasum. And that's where you want the milk to end up, not in the rumen, but directly in the abomasum. And in the abomasum, there's all sorts of enzymes and other goodies that start digesting milk. And on the right, I added a, a couple of uh, 
human babies. And I want you to understand that our calves that we are raising on farm are not so much different than those uh, babies on top. Because when a baby latches on his or her mother's breast, it also forms a cup with his tongue. And the moment it swallows, the, the liquid that comes out of the breast will uh, bypass the pharynx, bypass the air canal, and go right away into the esophagus. And in a way, we, haven't, we as humans have never forgot this reflex, because the moment you start swallowing, and you can try it at home right now, you push your tongue up the roof of your mouth, and you close off a piece of your airway canal, preventing milk or other liquids to end up in that, in that way. So in a way, we are not that different. And the esophageal groove reflex also works in that way. So during this, um, during this webinar, I, um, I'm going to throw out some of those statements. For example, here you see most scours is man-made. And then I'll explain a little bit about this statement. And then with your hand, you can raise your hand whether you agree or not. And then Yvonne will give you the uh, will give us the results. So in this case, my statement is most scours is man-made. And what I mean is that, sure, there's a lot of potential risk from outside, a lot of pathogenic uh, threats. We have parasites like crypto, like coccidiosis. We have viruses like rota, the famous coronavirus. We have uh, bacteria like uh, E. coli or salmonella. But all those pathogens are not as important as the one that we can create ourselves. Let me know if you agree. Yeah, so just to repeat, if you agree with this statement, most scars is man-made, please raise your hand. I see hands are going up and actually the number is going up and down again. So people are doubting. Um, but yeah, let's let's close the vote. Um, roughly a little bit less than 50% uh, agrees. 50, 50, uh, that's, that's very nice. So I'm, I'm still here to convince the other 50% because we believe that this statement is true and I'll explain you a little further on why that is. So I'll give you a, a few examples of countries all around the world, because I made that statement in the very first slide that this is a worldwide number one problem. So for example, here we are in uh, Saudi Arabia, and um, I hope you're not eating uh, breakfast or lunch at the moment, because you might see some, uh, uh, some foul uh, images. But first and foremost, a calf. A calf is doing fine, but it has some clay-like feces. So no scours, no diarrhea, but it's clay-like, so you can actually build something with it. The scour's color is grayish. It can either be light or dark, but it is homogeneous in color. And why do I emphasize the homogeneity? Is that when it's, when it's not homogeneous, then there is a pathogenic background. For example, greenish or reddish. But if it's homogeneous, if it's one color, either gray, light or dark, then we're talking about a specific topic. This calf also has no fever. The second example is from China. Well, here it is actually scours, so no clay-like material anymore. Once again, homogeneous in color, gray. The calf is feeling depressed. It's uh, off feed. It's not wanting to drink any more milk. Uh, hair loss is one big thing. Uh, you can actually take out the hairs quite easily. But once again, no fever. And then the last example is a calf from my home country, the Netherlands dark gray scours, as you can see on the right. And this calf is actually really in pain. Teeth are grinding, pain in the belly, it's kicking on its belly. You can see it's round, there's bloat, there's air inside that animal. Also hair loss, but once again, no fever. And I'm emphasizing this, no fever. No fever means that there's a big chance that there is no pathogenic background. A virus, a bacteria will cause a fever. So, what I'm trying to show you with these examples is the example of rumen drinking. So the definition of rumen drinking is either the improper closure of the esophageal groove, which is that groove that leads the milk from the esophagus straight through the abomasum, or 
it can be the abomasal overflow. So the moment you put too much milk in that last stomach, it will simply flow back into the rumen. And this allows the milk to go into the rumen instead of the abomasum, which I will explain later on is not a good idea. So just to give you some samples, really how, how often does this uh, rumen drinking occur? Well, we took a couple of years ago, we took a, a random sample of calves coming from all different farms around the Netherlands. When we start up our research trial here in uh, Fort House in the Netherlands, we work with calves 14 days of age. That's the, the legal limit in the Netherlands before you can transport your calves. So those calves at 14 days of age, in total 24, were all rumen flushed. So basically they were uh, injected a stomach tube, put a little bit upside down and see what comes out of that rumen. And you see that in more than 70% of those cases, milk flows out of the rumen. So we we're not talking about a minor issue in this case. So what is rumen drinking? So first and foremost, it can be the improper closing of the esophageal groove. M milk will flow directly into the rumen. And secondly, the abomasum can be overflown, too much, too much milk, too large of a volume in the abomasum, and it will flow back into the rumen. So what's the big deal? What, what happens when milk is part of the, uh, of the rumen structure and, and starts to mix with all the bacteria and all that stuff that is in that rumen that the milk is not supposed to be there? So first and foremost, you see that the milk starts rotting. It doesn't sound, doesn't sound nice because it ain't, Rotting, it will produce gases. In, in difficult terms, it's called ruminal tymp tympany. We also call that bloat. So this is the cause that those bacteria start producing gases and the animal starts filling up like a balloon. Secondly, milk in general, whether it be whole milk or milk from a milk replacer, is high in fat. And bacteria in the, in the rumen, they really, really don't like the fat, so it has a detrimental effect on the microbiota living in the rumen. And thirdly, there is lactose in milk, the milk sugar, which we call lactose. And there is bacteria that can get that lactose and start making lactic acid, dropping down the pH, leading to rumen acidosis. So there's already three reasons from the rumen perspective why there is a bad idea to have milk inside the rumen. And also further on, in the small intestines, the toxic substances that are formed in the rumen, they go through the abomasum and eventually end up in the small intestine. And as you know, the small intestine has this finger-like structure, we call them villi. And those villi will start breaking down the moment they get in touch with those toxic substances. This is called villus atrophy. And the moment those villi break down, there is less space for nutrients to be taken up. <clears throat> so, what are really now the factors influencing rumen drinking? Well, there's two of those that I'd like to highlight in this presentation, but the other ones we shouldn't forget as well. So one of the factors that influence ruminal drinking is too large volumes, alomasal overflow, too low drinking temperature, drinking temperature, I discussed that later on, variations in concentration, either, for example, too low, too waterish, particles in the milk, lumps or even straw that, that accidentally end up in the milk. Irregular feeding times and patterns can cause rumen drinking. Stomach tubing is a big one. The moment you start stomach tubing, uh, either, for example, electrolytes or milk, it will always end up in the rumen. It will rarely, rarely end up in the abomasum because the stomach tu tube simply ends at the end of the esophagus and it will flow right into, into the rumen. But also health problems like pneumonia, or stress like long distance transport can have a huge influence on ruminal drinking. But as I said, there's two that I like to focus on. One is volume, the other one is temperature. So the first one is, uh, is the volume. It's better not to offer a newborn calf in the first week of life more than two liters or two quarts, uh, metric and imperial in this case are virtually the same, of milk per feeding. So it's better not to feed more than two liters per feeding. What do you uh, what do you think about that? Raise hand if you agree. Uh, 
I think the number is sticking to around a little bit less than one third of the participants. That's great. So it's a little little less than the, than the other statement where we had 50-50. So now the majority disagrees. The majority thinks that you can feed, easily feed higher volumes than just two liters or two quarts per feeding. That's great in the first week. And then there's a lot to learn. So we go to the next uh, slide. Welcome Stella again. But now we focus basically on the abomasin, the size of the abomasin, that true stomach in that first week of life. So as I said in the very beginning of the whole stomach complex, the content or the volume of the abomasin is about 70%. It's the biggest one out of all four. But if you compare it to her whole body size, it's only 5%. In this case, our Holstein Friesian calf, let's say it's only 40 kilograms, 5% means that at two liters or two quarts, that abomasin is full. When you have a Jersey calf, a young Jersey heifer calf of only 30 kilograms, 5% means that there's only 1.5 liters. The moment you start feeding more than that 1.5 liters in the case of a Jersey calf, you start overflowing the abomasin and it will flow back into the, into the rumen. So I would like to uh, introduce a couple of uh, practical notes, because I mean, there's a lot of theory behind this, but um, it's always nice to make that link back to practice. Um, a few um, months ago, I was uh, very lucky to be part of um, our uh, United States Bank of It Ensemble, and uh, I was able to visit a farm in the United States with one of our sales uh, colleagues. And that uh, farm was actually doing, uh, doing very well. I mean, the, uh, the farmer, she was uh, very enthusiastic, ra raising her calves to her, uh, her best of abilities. She was feeding milk, no milk replacer yet. Um, the milk was pasteurized, good thing there. Uh, milk was fed lukewarm. We're talking about 35 degrees, so roughly uh, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius. And, um, but I pointed to her, I pointed to a few calves. They were, they were not doing well. I mean, those were calves in the, in the, in the previous examples. Calves with grain manure, uh, calves were bloating, the hair was easily to pull out. So I pointed to that calf and I said, what do you think about this one? And she start, immediately she starts um, saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're doing our very best that the moment we simply cannot feed more. And I see, how, mu how much are you feeding? She says, I'm feeding four liters or four quarts. And I said, that's, that's okay. Two quarts in the morning, two quarts in the afternoon. So what can be the problem here? She says, no, no, I'm feeding four quarts in the morning and four quarts in the afternoon. And I, I looked at that animal. It was a Holstein Friesian, barely 35, 40 kilograms of, of weight. So she was drinking four liters and, she, and that calf was drinking it. But after a couple of days, she basically dropped down. So then I told her, wait a second, maybe that is, the, that is the problem. You shouldn't start feeding more. Maybe it is a problem, less is more. So I gave her two examples. So here you see the high feeding plan where you start with three liters or from the second day, it's, it's a practical example. And, they, and it's, the calves are drinking it fine, but then at day six, they drop down. I mean, they've been eating a Christmas meal for four days in a row. And then at the sixth day, they drop down and it's just a little bit too much. But as you can see, day six, they only drink one liter in a 24 hour period. Day seven, they start drinking again because they're, they're kind of hungry from the previous day. But then at day eight and nine, you see scours. You see that, that gray scours. And then at day 10 again, she comes up. In the other example, where we start slow with two liters, you see that from day two all the way to day six, Two times two, two times two liters is um, is what the calf is being offered, and is what the calf is uh, is also drinking. And then day seven onwards, you see that the calf is being offered three liters, and she starts actually consuming those three liters. So at the very first, you would say that feeding plan A, where you plan to give the animal fifty four liters in a ten day period, is ten liters more than the other one. But if you look at the results, you see that because of those three days that the calf was not doing very well in plan A, it actually got seven liters less as compared to the one on the low feeding scheme. So in this case, less really is more. Well, that's a practical example 
obviously we need to test that in our research trial. So like Ion explained, we have a beautiful research facility. Um, hopefully in a few months from now, we actually can renovate a whole new cab line, uh, which hopefully uh, can open in 2022. Um, and that research barn, we do amazing, amazing research, one of which is the trial that I'd like to discuss with you right now. So the treatment in this case was calves were fed twice daily for the first 10 days, just a short period of time uh, the calves were actually monitored. Obviously, they were fed afterwards as well, but they were only monitored for a, for a, a short period of time. And they were either given two or three liters per feeding by bucket, no teeth, but, and the milk replacer was the same, so no difference there. The animals were host in Parisian, and there were 24 animals for treatment. The animals weighing about 41 kilogram at the start of the trial. So here you see the results. And as you can see on the left, on the group of calves that were fed two liters per feeding, and this is the diarrhea or the scours that can be seen from day one all the way to day 12, you see that there is virtually no diarrhea. Only at day six, there is a couple animals that show some light to moderate scours. The calves that were fed three liters per feeding, however, you see that there was a peak around day three and four of both light and moderate scours. But also at day five and six, you see, uh, you see calves having even severe scours. That means that just by increasing the volume per feeding, the scours incidence can raise tenfold. So one of our first and foremost recommendations that we often give globally is that for the first 10 days, or at least the first week, feed at maximum 5% of the body weight. You might think for some calves it's not, not enough, but for some calves it's maybe plenty. So make sure that you feed your average animal 5%. For example, a Holstein Friesian, 40 kilograms, two liters per feeding. Okay, then we have a farmer that thinks that four liters per day, because two times two, four liters per day, is, is not enough. She wants to have good performance in her calves, um, wants to feed at least six liters per day, but feeding it three times two is not a viable option, and she doesn't want to overfeed on volume. So currently what she's doing, she's feeding two times three, but we all know uh, what the consequences of that can be. So what we recommend, obviously, is three times two. However, we also know that in this case, that's not a viable option. So what we would recommend is a compromise. Start feeding two times two, with volume going down, but the concentration going up. And even though the total amount of milk replacer per day is, is still 700, it's a little bit less, but you'll save yourself a lot of scouring issues when you start feeding in two times two instead of two times three. And then I, I already can hear you wondering, well, 175 Pascal, that's, that's maybe a little bit too much, isn't it? Because cow's milk, as you can see, often solid percentages of, of 12, 13%, um, but a calf milk replacer concentration standard can be 150. A good milk replacer can easily go up to 175 grams per liter. In Imperial, that's about five to six ounces per quart, but I'm talking about a good quality milk replacer here. And a good quality milk replacer is, has a lot of factors, has a lot of issues to look at, but especially this one, the ash content should be lower than 9%, has to do with the osmolarity in the product and a high ash, high ash content can be an indicator of using uh, low quality ingredients. In addition to feeding at a high concentration, always feed at libitum fresh water. But the moment that you would like to increase your feeding scheme, you would like to increase the amount of powder that the animal or the amount of milk that the, the animal receives per day, try to increase concentration first and volume second. It will save you a lot of trouble. Okay, final statement. This one is about the method of feeding. So feeding milk without a teeth causes digestive problems in calves. So feeding milk without a teeth, that means in a bucket or a feeding trough, um, feeding milk without a teeth causes digestive problems. Let me know what you, what you think about this. You know the drill. Raise your hand if you agree.
I think uh, what I see is that around a little bit more than one third of the participants agrees. Great. So once it, uh, like, like the second statement, about one third agrees, so two third doesn't. Um, that's great. Uh, because we, we often see when we go worldwide that still most of the calves all around the world are fed by bucket. So there's bucket, nothing in there, just a layer of, of milk consuming, calves consuming the milk without the teeth. So there is a huge debate, teeth versus bucket. There is plenty of variations in, uh, in feeding methods. You have uh, feeding troughs, you have buckets with or without a teeth, or in American English, a nipple. So uh, buckets with or without a nipple. You have automatic feeders, you have milk bars, you have bottles, you have milk carts like they use in New Zealand. There's plenty of different variations, but the main topic of discussion is teeth or no teeth. So if you fed your calf by teeth or nipple, then the natural posture, which is the calf standing upright, drinking with a straight neck, is already taken care of. Also the sucking reflex that it gets by sucking on a teeth or a nipple is taken care of. So two uh, green checks on the, on the teeth one. The bucket, however, is a little bit hard, is no natural posture because the calf really has to bend down to consume its milk. And also the suckling reflex is gone because it's basically a big puddle of milk. So first and foremost, we as the interview, we always would recommend that a teeth bucket or anything that has a teeth attached to it is always preferred. However, bucket feeding can be successful too. And I'd like to take you with me on that journey. So the esophageal groove reflex, that, that um, amazing creation that is, that is right there to help that calf giving the milk from the esophagus to the abomasum is activated by a couple of things. Natural posture, straight neck, suckling ref reflex. And in this case, the calf on the left, you, said it, you see that it does both things. It's standing straight up, drinking from a nipple, perfectly fine. The ideal height of a nipple would be about the nose height of the calf. And in this case, temperature is not even important. Sometimes we, we have uh, our ad libitum or uh, unlimited feeding strategy, which we feed our milk cold or, or room temperature, and it will still go straight to the abomasum. This calf on the right is lacking some of those activation factors. No natural posture, nor a suckling reflex. And in this case, it's even worse because the bucket is right on the floor. So first and foremost, the bucket should never be on the floor. About 20, 25 centimeters or eight to 10 inches should the bottom, the bottom be off the ground. But in this case, also the temperature is very, very important. And I really want to emphasize this. So the temperature of about 41 to 42 degrees Celsius may sound a little bit too high, but that's really the ideal temperature for a calf to drink its milk. It's about 105, 107 degrees Fahrenheit. So once again, an example. Um, this one is in, uh, in Canada. It can be cold in Canada, so it's a, it's a good example. So here we start mixing our milk. 42 degrees, perfect. Farmer, farmer is doing an excellent job, exactly how we told him or her to, uh, to mix the milk at the right temperature, 42 degrees. But then it's transporting the milk from a mixer into a milk wagon or a milk cart. And because the whole surrounding is already cold, the milk drops in temperature slightly. Then it starts feeding its, uh, its calf. As you can see, they have a successful calf range and they have quite some calves to feed. So at the moment they are at the very last one, the milk has already dropped down another two degrees. So it's already at 38. Then the milk is put into the bucket or into the pail and it drops another two degrees. And you can see it goes from 42 right down to 36. And at 36, the calf is actually being offered that milk quite, quite a bit lower than what you started off with. And then another nice anecdote is um, pre-corona times. Uh, we still remember those times where we were able to uh, to travel around. I was um, luckily enough to um, to visit a farm in uh, in Chile, and in the, in Chile it was um, it was February. It was um, it was early morning. <laughs> it was actually quite chilly, and uh, it was about zero degrees. So around right around freezing freezing at time uh, freezing point uh, thirty two degrees Fahrenheit, and you saw that because we were there. The farmer was doing everything right. I mean, he actually showed it to us that the moment he had that 
milk in his uh, in his mixer, it was 42.0 down to the to the decimal point. So he was doing exactly everything right. Then he took two liters because that's what his calves were being fed, as we told him. So he's doing everything right once again. He put two liters into that stainless steel bucket, a metal or steel bucket, and he puts it in, and the milk drops down another five degrees. So the moment that milk drops in the bucket, we put a thermometer in there, and you saw that it was once again 37 degrees. And that farmer had no idea where all that temperature goes, but that stainless steel, uh, where all that heat goes, but that stainless steel bucket was actually pretty cold. So you saw that it dropped again. So once again, uh, an example from practice, a farmer that wants to feed as, as good as possible, but he or she can simply not ensure that the milk will be given to the calf at 41 or 42 degrees. So first solution is check your temperature. Just do, do it in as, as, an, as an exercise. Check your temperature along the way you're feeding and adjust. For example, the farmer in, in Chile, start mixing at a higher temperature. So your calves will be fed at a higher temperature. And secondly, the solution is use teats or nipples. Because I said that with teats and nipples, your um, temperature is not of importance. And a teeth or a nipple in many different variations can actually solve a lot of problems. And you have them in a lot of different variations. You have milk bars, you have bottles, you have milk carts. You even have a floating teeth. So you, there's a feeding trough and you can, you can put a teeth on top and the animal, sure, it does not have the right posture, but it can still drink with the suckling reflex. And also an automatic feeder is one of those options. So a teeth in many variations can actually solve a lot of issues. All right, so now we have found a couple calves with, uh, with rumen drinking. You can see them because of the examples that I gave you in the very beginning. Uh, some of them are alarming, light scours, rough hair coat, but it can also be preventative. Uh, the calves that are arriving on your dairy beef operation, for example, uh, you saw that at least 70% or so arrives with, rumen, with, with milk in their rumen. The first and foremost thing you should give them is water. Well, a young calf doesn't often drink water voluntarily, so add some electrolyte product for the taste. The sugars will make the, the water taste a lot better. If you are already feeding those calves at least one hour after feeding, after milk feeding, at noon, in between those two feeding is best because the calves may be a little bit hungry again, so start ingesting the, the electrolyte or the water better. And now it's something important. First and foremost, lukewarm. So don't feed your electrolyte or your water at 40, 42 degrees Celsius, but feed it at about 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, 85 to 95 degrees Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit. Also via a bucket, no teeth. And now you may think that you just explained that a teeth can solve a lot of issues, which is true. But in this case, you actually want the electrolyte and you want the water to end up in the rumen because the rumen is, is filled with, with milk and you want to flush that out. So the moment you offer it this way, it will actually go into the rumen, it will flush it out, and then it will go to the back end. Okay, but there's also like the third example that I showed you, that calf looks like a balloon. He's, he's not doing very well. He's not drinking at all. Uh, severe scours or even rumenal bloat. What you then have to do is you have to stomach tube your calf some water. So you basically have to flush the rumen. So what you do is you take a tube with a funnel, two liters of, of lukewarm water, you put it into the rumen of that calf, you shake the calf very carefully, a little bit like uh, uh, left and right, and then you push it, put it upside down, uh, the neck bending downwards. So the milk, the, the water with the milk contaminated can actually flow out. Then secondly, add some bicarb, more or less about uh, 100 gram per liter. Uh, per liter, you add, let's say, one liter of this solution back into the rumen, and it will actually balance the uh, rumen acidosis that may have occurred. However, very important because a lot can go wrong, and that, ca that calf has scours and, and, and ruminal bloat at the moment. But if you don't do this with trained personnel, then eventually you have far bigger problems than just the uh, scours or rumen bloat. So only, only trained personnel. All right. So we're almost at the end of, uh, of this webinar. And I, I really hope that you, that you at least got a couple of, of the messages that we want to bring across. 
Um, first and foremost, the newborn calf is a functional monogastric. Sure, it has four stomachs, but there's only one, the abomasum, which is the really focal point of, of uh, digestion of that calf, first couple of weeks of life. The esophageal groove, that's a creation that is, uh, we should not be forgotten. I mean, the esophageal groove is there for a reason, bypassing the rumen, bringing that milk straight from the esophagus to the abomasum. Rumen drinking is actually problem, a uh, worldwide problem, number one. It's often not seen on a farm uh, because uh, first and foremost, what you check on a sick animal is temperature, but a calf that's rumen drinking doesn't show increased temperature. Teats and nipples can uh, solve a lot of issues, um, but if you really don't want to feed with a teat or a nipple and you want to stay with your bucket, that's not, a, not an issue, but really pay attention to that temperature. 41, 42 degrees is what you should aim for. Maximum volume, especially that first week, first 10 days of life, is, uh, should be at the maximum 5% of body weight. Concentration can go up to 175 if, the, if that's a, a solution to uh, not increase the volume too much. But most importantly, how do I get my calf through this crucial life phase? It's really three things. Calmness, you should offer your calf a calm and peaceful environment, cleanliness, should offer us hygienic, uh, clean your teeth, clean your buckets, clean the pens. But last but not least, consistency. I mean, not only calves, but also in, in our personal life, in, in relations, we shouldn't have too high highs and too low lows. It should be consistent all the way from start to finish and offer your calf also consistency. No variations in concentration, temperature or volume, try to be as consistent as possible. And I actually um, made it translated for you in, uh, in all different languages. So you really have no excuse not to at least take this one as a, as a take home message. And um, if your language is not there, give me a call and I'll, uh, I'll make sure that that one is also translated in your language. All right, so this is the, um, the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you very, very much for this opportunity. And um, the floor is open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal and um, Ayan. Well, there are quite a lot of questions. Um, and let me start off by a question asked by um, Maud. And it's a combined question. Let me quickly have a look. Uh, what about the tubing of three to four liters of colostrum um, as for... Uh, as as first meal, um, because you told us about a maximum of five percent body weight, which accounts to approximately two liters per feeding. Is this also the maximum for the amount of the first colostrum? That's a that's a that's actually a great great question, and and Maud really paid attention on this one because she, she's right. Uh, four liters on a, on a forty kilogram Holstein Friesian accounts to ten percent. So in the case of colostrum when it's the very, very first meal of that animal, then the amount of four liters is not an issue. And the reason is that colostrum should be given at the right quantity, four liters, quality of bricks of at least 22, 50, 50 grams per liter of, uh, of IgGs and um, at the right time. So sometimes people offer a calf uh, colostrum by, by bottle, but it doesn't want to drink, and then they grab the chew. This is not a, not a problem at all because the rumen at the very first day of life is basically sterile. There's no bacteria in there. So if the, if the colostrum does end up in the rumen via tubing, that's not a problem. However, second day or the second days onwards, never ever start tubing your milk or colostrum again. So only the very first time. I think that's a very uh, elaborate uh, answer. Thank you very much. Um, let me have a look, because a lot of new questions uh, are, are asked as well, but let me first go back a little bit and uh, just for everyone to know, in case we are not able to handle all questions that are asked, um, an email will be sent to you with the questions uh, and, the, and the possible answers from uh, uh, Pascal and from uh, Ayan. 
Um, let me have a look. A question from Robert. Why are the calves bucket fed and not fed with a bucket with a teat in the trial? And once again, a, gr a great question. Um, because we are a research barn, but at the same time, we are just an ordinary barn. We are we're an ordinary barn where we actually pay a lot of close attention to our calves. So if we start feeding our all our calves with a bucket with a nipple or a teat, and our customers or they, they read out about our research, they say, yeah, but it doesn't apply to me because we feed our calves by bucket. So in our research facility, we have a different surroundings, different feeding methods. So it applies to all sorts of practices outdoors. Thank you again. Uh, very clear. Um, we have a question, anonymous question. Um, but what was the difference on ADG in the trial and what was the composition of the milk replacer? Hmm. Uh, that answer I, I, cannot, I cannot give because I, uh, we, don't, we did not uh, weigh the animals in that trial. We only had the start weight, but we did not have the end weight. And uh, the milk replacer composition can be shared afterwards, but I don't know by heart, by head. A very clear and honest question, Pascal. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so maybe later on. And anyway, thank you for uh, asking the questions. So keep on going. Yeah. Um, let me have another look. Um, another question from Maud. What is your advice to control the hygiene of the nipples regularly? Mm. Yeah. That's a, that's a good one. Um, well, if you have the chance, if you have enough buckets and enough, enough nipples, try first and foremost to have one calf per nipple, especially in the first, uh, let's say, two weeks of life when you ideally put those animals in individual hatches or individual boxes, then you could be able or you would be able to have one teeth or one nipple per animal. When, it, when you don't, then uh, you have groups of animals so let's say housed per five or six and yeah and then you start feeding your your calves by uh, like a milk bar and then you sure have uh, calves perhaps drinking from each other's uh, teeth and that way sharing some of the uh, sh sharing some of the pathogens that are for example in the mouth the proper way of cleaning a nipple or an actual or, or a teeth is to really first flush it out with cold water so not with hot water because the biofilm may actually uh, the biofilm that's inside the teeth can actually start uh, attaching to the inside of the teeth. So the first flush should be with cold water, and then you should add a detergent that is uh, uh, like, an, like a, an alkaline detergent that actually takes that biofilm and flushes it out. And an alkaline is really the, the, best, uh, the best option in this case uh, with hot water. And lastly, you just flush it out with some cold water again, and you're your teeth and nipples are clean as they can be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see we have a question from uh, Raymond. What to feed in the colder weather as here in Ontario in the winter? Mm. Ontario can be pretty, pretty cold. Um, so what to feed? Yeah, well, increase your concentration. We've, we've made a, a very nice calculator a couple of months ago, which is called our winter calculator. And in this winter calculator, you see that a calf or a, or a calf feeding facility is feeding at 125 or 12.5%. If you increase that to 15% in winter, you'll already take account for that loss of heat because of the cold environment. Also, a good way is not just to look at temperature, or sorry, not to look at the milk, but also look at the calf and the environment itself. Have you taken care of a good straw bedding? dry and you're able to you to put your knee inside the straw and you come out and the knee is still dry so you have a nice straw bedding and think also about a, a calf jacket or a blanket of some sort so sure you can increase the amount of uh, powder uh, energy that you give to that calf but uh, also think about the environment of the calf itself and just one one last uh, thing on, on this uh, often people think that in winter, I should start feeding a different milk replacer, for example, milk replacer higher in fat. So compare a 2420, which is 24 protein and 20 fat with um, a 2020. So there is 4% more fat in the first one as compared to the other one. 
But what you don't see in that 2020 is the amount of lactose. Lactose is a sugar that also has a lot of uh, energy. So at the, same, at, at the moment you increase your fat, uh, in the end, your milk replacer is 100%. So if you increase your fat from a 2020 to a 2420, your, um, your lactose starts dropping down. So basically you're not adding fat, but you're replacing one energy source for the other one. And sure, fat has a higher energy density, but the amount of energy that, that you win with this is not that much. The amount of energy that you win with increasing the concentration is actually putting on top of what you're already feeding. Thank you. Thank you. The, the questions keep on coming coming in, so that's, uh, that's wonderful. A long evening. <laughs> yes, I believe uh, we can go uh, on and on, um, which is a good thing. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, at least we trigger something. Maybe the yeah. people are not, uh, not um, agreeing with us, but at least we trigger. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and that's the way we like it. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah, let me pick another question um, uh, before we actually go into the um, live discussion with a couple of the uh, participants. Um, a question from Edwin. Uh, let me see if I got the entire question. Won't, uh, won't increase in CMR concentration cause scours? Um, if, if, is that the question or is there a, uh, an example? That's the question. Okay. Um, well, okay. If you because uh, one of those three um, main things that I said is consistency. Keep your concentration the same. Uh, and and what I'm saying right now, if you increase concentration from one day to the other, you're gonna start disturbing the digestive system of the cat. So if you are planning on doing a concentration increase, uh, if you already fed that calf at 12 and a half percent, and you want to increase it to 15 percent, do it slowly. Take a step in between, for example. But if you do it right from the start, if you start feeding 15% or if you start feeding 17% right from the start, then there's no, no uh, issue on, on scouring. Thank you. I think it's time for um, one more question. Yeah. Um, or maybe two, because there's so many. Um, Juanita asks, uh, you mentioned we could mix some electrolytes to the water just to add some flavor and encourage the calf to drink. Is there a specific electrolyte that you recommend taking into account that the calf doesn't have plain water anymore? Um, well, I, I, I promise that I wouldn't make it a sales pitch. So uh, <laughs> I, I, but now you put me in a difficult situation because I, I know of a very, very good electrolyte. Um, but that's uh, sales is not my 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 part. Um, but the electrolyte, I mean, the electrolytes that are on the market right now, some of them can be so elaborate and so complex. But an electrolyte, it shouldn't be that that difficult. Electrolyte should contain electrolytes, and the right uh, the right um, ratio should contain some some sugar. But it shouldn't be a fancy uh, electrolyte at all. So if you see an electrolyte which has which has an additive this and an extra that leave it on the side because your electrolytes should be just as simple as possible. But um, in this case, Juanita, if you want uh, to talk a little bit more about electrolytes, we, we, offer, a, <laughs> we offer a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the last question um, before we go into the live discussion. Yeah. Um, let me see. There's a question from Monica. Do you recommend water offer since early age? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I had to think about that for a couple of seconds, but definitely. Um, we would say water recommendation would be about 10% of a calf's body weight. So if you start feeding like we recommend at 5% in the morning and 5% in the afternoon, you think that you have that 10% exactly right but that 5% contains water and about 15% solids. So on top of that, you should always offer a calf water because with the two times two, the water requirement is not yet um, taken into account. So it's, not, it's not yet right there. So yes, right from the start, offer your calf water because you will also offer your calves uh, solids right from the start just to get used to it and solids and fresh water, they really go hand in hand. And with solids, I mean calf starter or hay or pellets. 
and they really go hand in hand. Very clear answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then now I would like, um, as I sent the participants an email um, who actually ticked the box uh, for going live uh, in, into discussion um, with both uh, Pascal and Arjan, I would like to invite three participants um, to go live and I will ask them to turn on their camera and their microphone. Um, first name I'm calling is uh, Paul Wigman. I hope you can, I will promote you to panelists so you can turn on your camera and your video. Then uh, let me have a look. Uh, a favorite, um, Martijn Damsteegt. Also, please uh, turn on your camera. And um, Kaka Nadiratse, would you like to join as well? You said yes, um, but it's always a question. Let me, here you go. Hi there, Martijn. Let me see. Um, is Paul there? And Ad, could you also turn on your camera? Maybe. Let me have a look. Um, who else? Is there anyone who would like to volunteer and uh, join the discussion live? Raise your hand. And yeah, so we take one more and that's Gabriel Calderon. So we have, let me have a, be very strict and have a look at the time. Yeah, so we have roughly 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more to, uh, to uh, have a discussion. Um, yes, maybe first we do a very, hi Gabriel, a very short introduction oh. round. Uh, just uh, tell us your name, uh, where you're from and what your position is. Um, Martijn, you know hi. the drill. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have my wife and a dairy farm in the south of Denmark, and uh, we are the owner. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Gabriel. Hello, my name is Gabriel, I'm from Argentina, I'm a daily advisor, I work for MSD, Animal mm -hmm. Health, and uh, with focus on, on, you know, calf racing for now, let's see what the future is. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether they are here, but Paul, could you introduce yourself? It's muted. Uh, and well, maybe he yeah, has some technical issues. Uh, Kaka, uh, are you able to uh, introduce yourself? No, not yet. Well, oh, I think we can. Uh, we think we can start with the with the panelists that we have right now. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, live, um, Martijn, I know um, you're busy um, with maybe setting up a, a, another uh, farm with uh, focus on calves. Is that correct? Uh, maybe you have a question already for Pascal. Um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, it get, uh, I get also new ideas. Um, on the first place, your colleague was talking about uh, raising a cow till a cow costs 500 euro. Uh, if it is possible for 500 euro, then you can raise all my calves. <laughs> <cow>. <laughs> no, no, wait, 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 before you elaborate, the, the difference it can be 500 euros. So oh, okay. 
uh, one heifer can be raised for for two grand or two thousand, and one can be raised for fifteen hundred. Yeah, <laughs> you would be able to raise one for five hundred. <laughs> you're gonna start working for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it's always a difficult subject, uh, cow raising, um, especially when you talk now about a two liter. Uh, yeah. I talk also much uh, with the other uh, sponsor from the uh, GDF, uh, Homer, uh, Holger Kruse. Yeah. We had a little bit uh, his concept also, and uh, also what uh, the other uh, sponsors say from the MSD. He was also get a one time presentation about calf racing. I'm still thinking about your four liter where you're talking about it. But is a calf not stopping with drinking when, uh, when uh, the stomach is filled, when the abomasum is filled? That is what I'm also thinking when you talk about it. Yeah. And also when you say, uh, when we go up to 175 gram uh, milk power per liter, mm -hmm. we have also tried it. But you need almost a spoon to, to drink, of, to eat. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, now I say it a little bit hard, but... Yeah, yeah, I, I get your point. Yeah, I get your point. That is when it is also difficult for a calf to drink uh, this high con concentration of milk. There's a little bit where we was, yeah, that we go back to the, uh, we are now on 50%. Yes. And they get four, uh, two times four liter. Yeah, does that yeah. is what. How do, you, how, do you feed, how do you feed them? By, by buckets? Or... By buckets, yeah. Okay. And we have a milk taxi. Dus the milk keep the temperature. At 42 degrees when until we give it. Yeah. We have not, what I heard from all the uh, calf, uh, the, 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 the girls who feed the calves, yeah. we have not big issues more with, the, yeah, with drinking and with diary. Yeah, you, you don't see the issues. We don't see it, but I'm also saying it. Yeah. But, we have, uh, but I must also say uh, what the man was talking about from the MSD about the protein. In the dry, dry period of the dry cows. Yes. We lift up the, the protein level for the dry cows. And after we have uh, not so many issues more with diary. That is also what that we learn about that. Yeah. Yeah. So now, now I start thinking about the two liter, but I'm missing a little bit what you say about uh, the growth. We want that we have at least 1000 gram. Of course. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that is I'm missing a little bit missing in your presentation. When yeah, I, 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 I can get up to that growth. But we, uh, we do want the, the, the one kilogram growth per day is something that is viable. I mean, it's 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 it should be reachable for a well managed dairy farm to have uh, pre winning growth of a thousand grams uh, per day. But as we've seen in, in our research, when we start fast on a bucket fed calf, so no, no teeth, and you see that the calf is actually starting to uh, lose interest in milk. But at the same time, you, you're, you're right, because you are feeding four liters, and I assume right from the start, right from day two or three? Yeah, from day two. The first day, they get colostrum uh, four liter. Yes, and then... And then the second day, uh, we start with uh, milk replacement. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a great example that also sometimes it can go right, because uh, what, we, what we try to uh, follow is the calf that is, let's say, the smallest. And then there is plenty of calves in that herd, in the same herd, that can easily go to uh, three liters or four liters per day. But if you then all do them four liters per day, then that calf, which is the smallest, will have a lot of issues. So if you feed it our, let's say our way, our uh, slow start way, there will be calves that can actually consume quite a bit more. Because also the abomasum, the one, the one right here, is like a balloon. So if you make sure the animal drinks uh, a little bit more slow, the, 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 the animation can also start increasing inside. It can stretch out. But since we are very careful with especially those smaller ones, then we rather have that the bigger ones may lose some, uh, lose some growth potential in the first week or two, then the, the, bit, the small ones uh, lose a lot of growth potential because they are scouring the whole day. Because we, we, we make our recommendations on the average calf, 
But at the same time, the average calf doesn't exist. I mean, there's calves 55 at birth, there is calves 35 at birth. So the average is 40, but that calf is not there. Yes. I, I, I very much like your, like your uh, uh, idea or your, your, your practice example. Um, but in, in, in your case, I, I would love to have a visit at your farm in, in Denmark and maybe in a couple of months it should be, should be able to. But um, at the same time, I'd like to say you don't have to be ill to get better. So sometimes you don't see the problem, but there is something, or maybe you don't see the problem because it has occurred for so many years and it's part of your normal day-to-day -day observations, but maybe there is some, some small things that can indeed be um, um, increased in performance. But you have not experience on the calf stop with drinking when they are full. No, no, because a calf and you, you, you I'm, I'm sure you know it and a lot of our participants know it, what happens when you put two fingers in front of a calf's mouth, it starts suckling, even as a finger, it starts suckling for five minutes because it's a reflex. The moment it feels something, it starts suckling and it does so for a very long period of time. And if that calf is able to drink four liters within the period that the suckling reflex gets tired, then it easily drinks more than it actually can, can cope. Because it's really a reflex. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Martijn. I think we can keep on discussing. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, Gabriel, uh, can I ask you from, from Argentina, uh, Gabriel mm, Calderon, uh, out of the, uh, let's say, three statements that I give you, how many did you disagree? Okay, uh, first of all, I agree partially with the uh, human produced uh, diarrhea. I partially agree. Yeah. I think. Uh, from the point that we start domesticating animals is something that we have to deal with. I mean, we have no options. That's why cows are under the roof. That's why we are in intensifying our, our system. That's why we are trying to get more milk per economic unit, let's say per cow. So it's a problem that is among us and that will be among us uh, for a long time, first. Secondly, I think, uh, there was a statement that I, I will recommend you to review uh, when you said, you know, uh, an aggressive feeding program versus a kind of, you know, more conservative one. Um, I will state as a gradual uh, feeding program, because I can tell you from four liters per day up to five liters a week, up to eight weeks, eight, I'm sorry, eight liters by the third week and keeping that for about two or three weeks and then going down. It's a sort of, you know, increase decreasing system. Perfect. Let, let, let me stop you let, right, right here because I, I really want to uh, um, uh, react on, on that response. Because if we, from the computer, me from, from behind my desk with my colleagues, make a feeding schedule, it goes from two liters for a few days to 2.25 to 2.5 to 2.75. But do you think there is any farmer around the world that knows, okay, this calf is four days of age, should be giving 2.5. This calf is eight days of age, so should be giving 2.75. I mean, there is machines that take over this job, but they are expensive. But when I was visiting the US, they, were, they have three quarter bottles. So a bottle fits about three liters. So if you come there with a feeding schedule that is two quarters or four quarters per day or per feeding, they say, sorry, cannot do because it only fits three quarters. So yeah, sure, you, you can explain yet, yeah, fill the bottle halfway or maybe one bottle, uh, one way and a half. But those, those the, the, the personnel that works there, they, they're not being taught the right way and you have to work your way around the practical way. Because I, I agree with you, you should gradually go up and gradually go down. But oh. You see that it doesn't always work. Let me tell me tell you my experience. I managed a four and a half thousand babies in Oregon, three mile canyon farms. And the way that we did solve that problem, the pragmatic issue yeah. was by feeding an extra time. So when we start increasing feedings or you know, uh, liters per day, yeah. we fit in an extra time for those that were in a high nutrition uh, schedule, yeah. let's say in that way. Yeah. 
I think milk taxis or machines are coming and they will be coming and they will still coming because automation and personal issues are all around the world. Yes. It's hard to get good people. So, uh, but I think that's the concept that we have to keep in mind or try to transmit and try to implement in our cars because the performance of those cars are, wow, yeah. day and night. And I, I, I greatly agree with you. If, if there is a farm that has a possibility to go to 3x or to three times a day feeding, that should be the first recommendation that we, that we can make. But often when I give that recommendation, that farmer says, yeah, but look at the farm, labor. Labor is the limiting factor. So there is a lot of farms in the US that have labor as an issue because there are not that many people, especially around this uh, crisis period, that are able to, to have their hands on, on farm. So I, I can recommend whatever I want, but they say we only have labor for 2x feeding. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm stepping in because uh, it's, it's almost time, but I believe we have one more panelist, Raymond Jansma. Uh, could you shortly introduce yourself and maybe you have a question for Pascal? Yes, I'm Raymond Jansma. I emigrated to Ontario six years ago. I'm a dairy uh, consultant for dairy farms in Ontario. Um, yeah, totally different market, of course, than uh, happens in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you are talking about feeding cows and using all kinds of additives and the use of antibiotics. That will possible also see that if you are in this side of the big, the big ocean, antibiotic use is pretty easy here. Um, and I think a lot of management tools are not used here to avoid it because we can easily get it here. It's only two years ago that we still can get all kinds of antibiotics over the counter. You go to the whatever we have in Holland, the Velcrope or other, other simple grocery store that you buy antibiotics for your cows with cows. Now for my time, that will totally difficult, of course, because Denmark, you have everything to do by the vet, but here it's really easy, it's still easy. Um, so there's a challenge here, but then back to the feeding, of <clears throat> what I also say in, in about a two or four liter, mm -hmm. I was checking on the internet about the big supply of the bottles. All the bottles are between three and four liters. And I remember me a big symposium and they say, we have extra big bottles now. Why this easier for you? But that's the total opposite than we want. And there's almost on the bottom, I can find one two and a half liter bottle and then really uncommon two liter bottle. But everybody I see there, how they look like, they're all 3.3 or four liters. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's really interesting here for, on, for Ontario or for North America. And I can you know, I say it more <laughs> in Europe, we are you know, in our business, if it is goats or, or cows, we are 15 or 20 or 25 years ahead with a lot of things. And, hmm. They don't like what we say that, but that's, um, I think we're Europe, we think North America is in head of everything. Yeah. But feeding wise, cows and cows, are we are really um, yeah. uh, yeah. five years uh, behind or maybe 15. That's a big challenge, right? Just to uh, keeping cows healthy without yeah. any sure. like romance. We can use it still here. Yeah, I must make our things to go here to. Uh, yeah. That's actually very, very nice that you uh, add that at the very end of your uh, of your uh, saying, uh, um, Raymond. Is that uh, the rumensin or other uh, uh, types of uh, coccidiostats uh, preventing uh, uh, parasite growing in, inside the manure of the animal? Here in Europe, it's been banned for years. And it, when the moment I went to the US, we even though it's also dengue, there we are able to use it. So it is already a huge difference between uh, two. Uh, companies on, on either side of the world that can actually start using medicine still in a milk appraiser, whereas here in Europe it's been it's been banned for for 10, 15 years or so. I was uh, a little disappointed that you guys didn't buy uh, Grover. You already buy Grover USA like a year ago, but I'm disappointed <laughs> that you guys didn't buy Grover in Canada. <laughs> yeah, but we we uh, we still have um, uh, so to say we still have a lot of contact with them. So uh, I leave it at that. Um, and the other one, the bottle one, I, I really like you. I, I, I really uh, like that you raised that as an as an example because uh, the bottle one has a nipple, perfect, preferred. Because with a nipple, the calf is drinking a lot slower than the gulps that it can get from the bucket, just from a plain bucket. And once again, I'm going to take this organ structure here in my hand. As you can see, the rumen is pretty tough. I mean, it's there's a lot of uh, muscle around it, whereas the abomasum it's like a baboon. So now it, it can fit two liters, but the moment I put a bottle in front of that calf, 
it starts slowly drinking from, from a small aperture uh, nipple or teeth, and it will start increasing in size, and it can fit three liters, four liters. There is studies uh, that, I, that I read this afternoon in preparation of this, of this uh, webinar that easily feed calves five to six liters at two weeks of age because the abomasum can grow inside that much. Also, not like 50 years ago in Holland that we're going to fed all that blue Belgian calves like 12 liter or whatever, or 15 liter, maybe my dying can also think about like years ago in Holland, we feed calves like piles of milk, like 12, 15, or even 18 liters. It was maybe 15 or 20 years ago, it was a big... Uh, oh, we still feed our veal calves uh, a lot of uh, volume, but at this... But it was, it was uh, like uh, uh, Belgian blue cows on dairy farms or even feeding more milk than we are doing now, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. But, uh, Give me one, one second, Yvonne. I, I, I didn't bring it for no reason. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the stomach uh, structure at birth. So you see the rumen fits in my hand and the abomasum is actually even a, lot, a little bit bigger than my hand is. And then here, I got one at 100 days. So just 14 weeks of age. And you can see the rumen really is this, the whole thing that I have in my hand with the reticulum right here, the omasum. Is on the on the back side. My, my hand is holding it, but the abomasum is just this thing. That's the only thing that's left. So going from from this structure, the rumen fits in my hand to the rumen doesn't even fit in my arm. That's how how much a rumen can grow in just a few few months time. Thank you. That's very visual. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Raymond, Gabrielle, and Martijn for uh, asking your questions and, uh, and, and turning on your, your camera. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we're at the end almost of our webinar. I'm just going to share my screen because it actually poses one more uh, question. Uh, participants, whoa. So uh, what I would like you to do is to raise your hand for uh, Pascal and Arjan uh, because they did such a wonderful job and there are so many questions asked uh, and still unanswered or maybe partly um, by everyone, uh, by, by Pascal and, uh, and Arjan. Wonderful, thank you very much. I, uh, I read there were also some suggestions for for new topics, uh, so that's uh, that's great. Um, then I would like to give the word to uh, our president at Van Velde for some final closing words. Also from my side, thank you, Pascal, Arjen, for this uh, great webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank the participants. What else is TDF organizing the, the coming months? We want to organize online Congress on at June the 8th with the title 20, 2021 Good Farmers, 2031 Great Farmers. We will do this in full cooperation with our business partners. We are now investigate uh, the possibilities and our farmers will play a large role in this event. We want to uh, organize small, short movies of all the farms and uh, so that we get a short impression of all our members. Uh, sometimes we organize also solution centers that is exclusive for GDF farmers. Uh, I already get some requests from GDF farmers with certain subjects. So maybe we will, uh, we will organize that as well. Uh, I should say, pay attention to our website and follow GDF on social media. Then you, uh, then you will be kept informed of all our events. If there are any questions, uh, ideas, feedback, please contact us. Uh, coming to the end, let's stay in touch. Thanks again, all of you. Take care, stay healthy, and hopefully we will meet again at one of our next events. Thank you all.